Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. We are local talk radio, and for the next hour, we are going to be talking about liberty, about what it means, about how we can get it, how we can hold on to what we've got left. You know, whatever else happens to be on your mind as far as that goes. Joining us today in the studio, we've got one of the sponsors of the show from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett. Of course, Bighorn Enterprises, the uh, place where you go for all of your trucking and construction needs. The, they're the ones that do those ads with the kids' voices. A lot of folks have asked about those. You give them a call, 451-7310, and find out more. Also, joining us from the Campaign for Liberty here in Fairbanks, it's uh, Dave Giesel. And somewhere around here, I saw Matt Want this morning. Did he... Uh, I tied him up. Oh, okay. All right, good enough. You tied him up, put him in a corner somewhere. Good, good. That'll be good. All right, so welcome, gentlemen. What is on our collective mind this morning? I think we were going to see about... There's no phone calls right now, but we've kind of neglected them the last couple shows. We also need to give the phone number for people to know what what number to call. It's 458-TALK. 458-8255 if folks would like to call in. And you out-of-staters just put a 907 in front of that. That's a good point. Matt's here. Matt Want, uh, you came back for more. I, you know, last time, uh, one of the first things my wife said to me when I got home from the show, she's like, you you, you ganged up on him. You beat him up. And I, uh, I, I did not make any apologies to her. I said, yes, you're right, we did. Uh, maybe we'll have him back on again and see if he uh, is willing to go for some more. I'm gonna give him the bad headphones. I'm not. I'm not afraid. I mean, I don't feel like it was beat up. I'd, it's. It's a much more interesting and fun for. I think for uh, everybody when, when there's a, a, debate instead of just everybody sitting down around patting each other on the back, going, "Oh yeah, you're ditto, right." Ditto. Ditto to what he said. Yeah, ditto. you're right. Yeah, no, you're you're more right. I mean, it's just. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to cut in and out. I'm trying to get these headphones to work. That's, that's all right. We gave you the bad pair. Do you want another bad pair? No, wait, uh, uh, the bad pair is, I was going to say, this is, we've got the very finest and used East German technology around this place. Come on now. No, I, I, I think I got, I, got them, I got them jimmy just right so that they work in the one ear. Yeah, that's perfect. Now, uh, let me ask you, Matt, uh, in, in terms of the reaction that you got after the last time you were on the show, did you, did you get any feedback? Did people tell you that, that they felt that you, uh, that you were right, that... Uh, that we ganged up on you, that you were wrong, that, I mean, what did, what kind of feedback did you get? Oh, what, what, the the feedback that I got was that uh, that was the most you had talked ever during the show, that typically the, the other two guys go, and then, and then uh, but they were glad that, they were glad that uh, you chimed in, and that we went back and forth, and uh, I had a couple people wanting you to further explain how, on one hand, the state is this uh, empire, untouchable empire, and on the other hand, you are the state, and some of that oil is yours. That's a that's a good question. <laughs> and so I I haven't fully worked it out in my mind yet, man. I mean, that's one of the things that I I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to be a socialist. Well, I, the, I mean, this the, is the basically well, I mean, this that is was, what the, that was going to be my question for you this week was you know you you're talking about the egg farms and stuff, and so I mean you live on property, right? I yeah. mean, you don't hover when you leave here. And <laughs> and true. so so you know if you found if you found gold nuggets or gravel I mean on your property and you wanted to to profit from that I mean do you feel that there's an ob- do you feel you have an obligation to give uh, a percentage of that to the state each time you pull another pebble out of your property You know what I don't and that's a really good point but if I were to go say to your property and start looking around for gold I would feel a responsibility to give you at least some of that gold And and that's where I look at what the what the oil companies are doing they're not out there on oil company land they're out there on state land which is again that whole aspect of well if it's state land who actually owns it Is it like the commons in the city is it just this general well, and then and then and then to I guess further complicate the question or the situation is, I mean we go we we get into these issues of private property rights. Well, how far back do we want to go? I mean, do we want to go back to you know uh, when the when this when it was fir- when it first became a state? Do we want to go to private property rights based on first occupancy? I mean, you know, at some point, if you want to say that we need to uphold private property rights, you still have this dilemma of um one native americans and two uh indigenous peoples to the to the area i mean if if we want to if we want to staunch stick to this idea of of private property rights when we purchased it back from the russians we should have 
or when we purchased it from the Russians, we should have returned it to the indigenous people that originally owned it. I mean, if you want to uphold the entire uh, uh, private property rights issue. I mean, you well, see that, that there's, okay. a, uh, there's a principle called um, original appropriation. Oh, and, and might makes right. That's another uh, principle as well. That's, that's no, no. Owner, and, and, there's a couple people in the studio who don't believe in that, um, regardless of that being the status quo. But uh. there's a principle called uh, original appropriation. And that's usually how property rights are delineated. Whoever originally appropriates the land is the title holder, and then they have a right to transfer that title. That title. But I know Josh has been reading a lot about the colonies before the United States was even founded, and a lot of property was transferred peacefully through contract from Indians to colonists. Obviously not all of it, but much of it was. Of course, you won't learn that in a government history book, um, Right, but I'm speaking specifically of Alaska, and I don't know how much uh, I don't know how much was peacefully traded between the indigenous yeah. people and the Russians. No, here's, that's, here's, that's an interesting question. Yeah, However, very good question. Uh, what Steve is grappling with is this idea that the state can own land, and that is where the, the socialism comes in. You're totally you're totally right about that, Matt. This, if the state is the landowner, right? We, we've always asked this question: Who is the state? And the state's just mm -hmm. kind of this idea. You have that's when you have a tragedy of the commons problem because it creates a commons. And then the question is, uh, you, you don't have property owners. It's not like Steve coming to your land to mine gold because if he wanted to mine gold on your land, you would have to write a contract to him, and he would be responsible to you directly, right? right. But even if Steve comes to my land and digs up gravel off of my land, somebody still has to pay the state the royalty on it. To, today, exactly. today they do, right? right? Exactly. Because the state makes itself. I mean, the state as a party to every single contract presumes itself to be a third party in every contract, and um, so you know what the, the the socialism you're talking about comes from the state claiming that they own the land on the North Slope or or anywhere, right? They they claim they claim you, you know you have to apply for mineral rights, and so that's where the that's where the socialism comes from, and then you have this battle the the idea that the state is is stealing a percentage of private property goes away and then you just have this battle over the eighteen thousand dollars per person that the state takes. And and that and the socialism's already done. You're right. Any argument any argument beyond how that money is doled out, whether it goes out through the dividend or whether we get all of our money, because by golly we are the state, is still sitting on top of a, a premise of socialism. Oh, and so Steve had asked what what some of the feedback was, and then mm -hmm. and then uh, some of the other feedback that I had was I guess for for our debate, Dave, um, you know about social contract theory and things like that. And so I came up with this idea: if you want to really instill in people uh, how how ingrained and how how um, how uh, oh. Well, what was I? I was um, indoctrinated. How indoctrinated people are with the social contract theory. The next time you're at the grocery store, any of you, I would invite any and all of you who don't don't want to adhere to social contract theory. When you're at the grocery store, don't wait in line. When you go to check out, just push your way right to the front. That's not a social contract, Matt. But but it, that, but it is a social. It is a social. It's a social norm. It is social not a social contract. Right, you but, have to well, no no Hold no Wait, no. I'm not done. Contract. Let me finish. Let contract, me Matt. <laughs> so what is a contract? Right to the front of the line, and then and then like don't if you need crackers, don't go all the way to the cracker aisle. Just find somebody who's already in line who has crackers in their basket and. Take them and put them in your basket. And then when they complain, be like, no, 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 these aren't your crackers. <laughs> They're that's, my crackers. That's what you do at the borough, Matt. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, it is. That's what you do at the borough. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. You go, that isn't your property. That's our property. <laughs> Pay up. Actually, that proves um, our point, Matt, because there is no law for you to go to the front of the line. There is no law against taking someone's crackers. But if you do that, the store owner will take it take or kick you out of there there's no law and yet i never push myself to the front there's no law saying that i can't take someone's crackers out of their bag until they uh, their cart until they buy them but i don't anyways why there's no law against it right because we don't want to be jerks we don't want to be jerks so we apparently can control ourselves even when there's no laws requiring us to control ourselves so why do we need laws i mean how many how far can you take that the social con the contract there is that you're going to someone's store. The store owner says, "Behave in my store, or I'll kick you out." If you misbehave, he gets to kick you out. Right, but if there are if there are if there are 
no laws, then how how would how would you how would someone ever be injusticed? Well, and, and, and how, take, would you, take, how would you take, not take the look at take, the, the the illustration you just gave with the supermarket is perfect because there are no laws. How many times do you hear about people doing exactly what you said? Is it just absolute pandemonium every time you go to the supermarket? Right, oh my goodness, I couldn't get through the line. I had to fight off five people trying to take my crackers. Right, but if there but if but if there are no laws, how how would you how would you seek retribution in say an assault case? This is what um, private property provides us with. All resources are scarce. I mean, you've read economics in one lesson, so you know this. All resources are resources are scarce. That's the point of economics. Right. Economics answers the question of how do we most efficiently allocate scarce resources. All resources are scarce. Private property is how we delineate the ownership of scarce resources. If a resource if a resource isn't scarce, you don't have a trespass problem, right? If a resource is scarce, you do have a trespass problem. That's how we deal with conflict, right? And that's Private property is the jurisdiction where you are sovereign. In your land, on your house, you can tell somebody to get out of your house, right? Right, and so what I'm saying is with no laws, how would you tell someone? That's how, that's how it's done already. There, there's no law that says you, you have to have somebody in your house or you have to kick them out, right? But, but people do that all the time. It's like, oh, party's over, get out. And then you take them to the door and you, you throw them out. It happens all the time. Yeah, all the you have to do is just turn off the keg and most people will leave on their own. Right. <laughs> public law. If you go back. So let, let's just use the Constitution because we're in America and we think that's when the world started. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how it is. The Const, what it was the Constitution? Where did those laws come from? How did they settle on um, those Ten Amendments and, and the original articles of the Constitution? Did they just pull that out of thin air or where, where did that come from? No, it seemed to be what was most egregious from where they came from, and so they addressed those immediately. Okay, actually, the Ten Amendments and the laws in the Constitution came from the uh, delegates at the Constitutional Convention. They said, th these are the laws in our states uh, that are common with each other, and so there won't be a problem if we codify this for, for the federal government because all these laws are already incongru are congruent with the laws in our states. Where did the laws in the states come from? They didn't come from the king. They were throwing their middle finger up at the king. Those laws came from the social norms that were already there. The social norms got codified into state laws, which then got codified into federal law. It was not the other way around, and it's never the other way around. Codified law, civil law, is always a codified version of what the social norms are anyway. But then it stands in the way of social norms changing. So as you have this kind of uh, moral evolution where people decided slavery was wrong and started nullifying slavery through the jury, slavery was still codified in the Constitution. And so the, the codified law restricts the ability of people to raise the moral standard of society because it's fixed in time. But the social norms are the, always the basis of the codified law. It's never the other way around. Well, and you see that a lot with, with um, in times of war, you know, as long as as long as there is a a strong public sentiment towards it to, towards being involved in a war then we're involved and once the once the the social winds have changed um, then we withdraw it's not whether or well, not the sure sure but let's look at like vietnam right the social winds changed and it took like 5 more years because once once something's been codified and decreed by the powers that be it takes a lot more to unwind it than to put it into action in the first place. And that's that's the danger of socializing these laws, right? You take, you know, a few people want to behave one way, a few people want to behave another way, and so they move to certain areas and live that way. And then you, you clump them together under one law, and what does that do? It generates conflict. It generates conflict that they'd resolved anyway by going somewhere else or by having different rules on their property.